to you today from this subject, a personal experience with God. Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor, have you had a personal experience with God? A personal experience with God. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. A personal experience with God or a personal experience with Jesus Christ. Let's be more specific. With Jesus Christ. It is interesting that when Muslims were horribly murdered, a few days ago, there was outrage and outcry about the killing of Muslims. But on Easter Sunday, when Christians were murdered, worshiping in their church, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and others call those people Easter worshipers and tourists. Now, why is it that if a Muslim is killed for any reason, it's an attack on Islam? Muslims are dead. But when Christians are killed, they're called Easter worshipers. Or when the Jews uh, were killed uh, at um, that printing house, uh, Hedgedo. Um, um, in Paris, they were simply referred to as folk. These things are intentional. They are intentional. There is a war on Christianity. The Bible predicted that in the last days men would be anti-Christ. So a personal experience with Jesus Christ. You may ask why Jesus Christ since I'm taking my subject from a story that took place literally 740 years before Christ was born. The simple answer is, I'm not the only one who thought that Isaiah saw Jesus. The Apostle John, the one who wrote the book of St. John, the writer who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and who wrote the book of Revelations, said that Isaiah saw Jesus also. St. John was written, the book was written 90 years after the death of Christ, which means that John wrote about this some 830 years after Isaiah recorded his vision in 740 B.C. John writes, or John wrote in St. John chapter 12, and verse 30, 37, he says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord 
been revealed. Now that's a direct quote of Isaiah 53 and 1. Therefore, they could not because they could not believe because Isaiah saith again. He have blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. That's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10, which this particular quote is very interesting because it warns that if you fail to believe when God has given you ample reasons to believe, sooner or later the Lord will stop convicting you and you will lose the ability to believe. It's like people who are cantankerous and they're just, they're just hard to get along with. After, after people, after a while, you know what people do? They stop trying to get along with you. If everybody's got to fight you to get along with you, if you're always the most difficult one in the family, if, if you're always the most difficult one in the church, you always keep something going, you're going to end up alone. Because sooner or later, you know what people say? It's not worth it. It is required by all of us especially those of us who are in churches where the scriptures are clearly preached and taught and laid out before you in context. It is required that you believe. One time too many, what will happen is the Holy Spirit will withdraw from you. And how do you know that he's withdrawn himself? You're no longer convicted. Your sin doesn't bother you. You think you're just getting away. Doesn't bother you at all. What has happened is, and that's the worst thing that can happen. What has happened is God himself has given up on you. And the last thing you want is for the Lord to give up on you. The last thing you want is to be able to begin to sin and not even feel bad about it. That's the last thing you want. He had performed miracles and the people didn't believe. And lastly, look at this. Verse 41 says, these things said Isaiah. Look at this. When... He saw his glory and spake of him. John 12 and 41 is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. John says, let me read 41 again. These things saith Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Isn't that something? But just as an aside, let me read verse 42 and 43 as a sad commentary. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. How often do we see this today? Where people will not speak up for fear of ostracism. If I say that I believe this or I believe that, people are going to talk about me. If I identify with this church, people are going to talk about me. Or they may not be my friend anymore. If I post certain things, someone may unfriend me. My question is, whose praise do you love the most? The praise of men or the praise of God? And what makes this a sad commentary is, this is a commentary on uh, chief rulers who believed on Jesus. They believed on him, but were afraid to step up. Oh, God, give me the courage of my conviction. Let me get back to the text. I don't have time to spend so much time on that, but you get the point. So, you see, John said that the theophany that Isaiah saw, 
he saw Jesus. Every believer must have for themselves a personal encounter with the Lord. In order to make it, every believer must be able to say for themselves, they must be able to say, I know him for myself. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we serve the Lord as a collective, but this is an individual thing. I was talking with uh, Sister Missionary Suzanne McCauley last Friday, and as we were studying, working on the text, and I said to her, I said, the reason our relationship is the way that it is is that we're both members of Upper Room. We both attend here. We both work here. We both have a lot in common. But another thing that we both have is we both know the Lord for ourselves. We know him collectively, but we know him individually. And I said to Suzanne, I said, I'll tell you what you can do. You can, you can strengthen my relationship with the Lord. And I can strengthen yours. I said, but I tell you, I bet you that there's something that I can't do. And she says, what's that? I said, I, I, bet, I bet I can't get you to deny him. I bet I can't get you to give up on him. I bet I, bet I can't get you to disbelieve that who he is, who he says he is. And she looked at me and said, no, Pastor, you can't do that. I said, why? And she gave the answer. Because I tried him and I know him for myself. You got to know him for yourself. Oh, my mama is saved. No, you got to know him. Thank God for a saved mother. But you got to know him for yourself. Because uh, I find that this thing doesn't happen on the family plane. What if your mother or your father are not saved? Which is the case with many. You got to know him for yourself. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, or say, you got to know him. Can I get a witness? For yourself. After her personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the woman of Samaria went back to her city and said to the men of that city, she knew the men, she said to the men, come see a man, God Almighty. I met a man unlike all of y'all. Come see a man, praise the Lord, who told me all things I ever did. And, and she was excited. Uh, she says, it's not this, the Christ? Woo, a woman who was with a man who wasn't her husband, and he was the fifth guy to occupy that seat. A woman who went to draw water at an odd time so as to avoid the rest of the women because she had a, a reputation for being a woman of easy virtue. Yes, she was greatly stigmatized. And while there, Jesus showed up, and it was not by mistake. God bless you, Mother Hunter. Good to see you this morning. Glad to have you back. Give her a hand. Hallelujah. Glad to see you this morning. Was not there by mistake because uh, the day before, Jesus said, uh, I must needs go through Samaria. That's the long way. Well, yeah, but I got to go that way. Amen. Because I got somebody I got to meet. And uh, when she got there, he was there. And said to her, give me to drink. And oh, they had a, they had a conversation. And it changed this woman. And she ran to the city. And she said to the people, come see a man who told me everything 
that I ever did. The Bible says, and they went out of the city and came to him, the men of the city. John chapter 4, verse 39 records what happened after that. It says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed on his word. Woo! And said unto the woman, they went back to him and said, Now we believe not because of thy sayings, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They said, yeah, we, we, we went out to hear him because you said go. But we want you to know that uh, we've come to the same conclusions that you've come to, but not because you told us, but we know him for ourselves. Hallelujah. There were men with the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus when he had his personal experience with Christ. Dr. Luke gives the account of Paul's personal experience. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 7, Paul says, Luke writes, And the men which journeyed with him, the men who were journeying with Paul, stood speechless and heard a voice but seeing no man. Acts chapter 9 and verse 7. Luke says, when that light shined from heaven, Paul wasn't by himself. There were men with him and said they heard a voice but they didn't see anyone and they were all speechless. But compare this to Paul's own testimony when he gave the account of the same story when he stood before a mob that had just tried to kill him. They had just stopped beating him. According to Acts 21 and, and, and uh, uh, chapter 21 and verse 32, it, it tells us that and Im who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them and when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers they left beating Paul they were trying to kill him and the chief captain came with a band of men and they rescued Paul but when Paul gave his testimony and he gave his account of uh his personal experience, Paul said this in Acts 22 and verse 9. He said, and they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Personal. They were with me. They saw the light. But they didn't hear what was said to me. And when you compare this to Paul giving the same testimony, uh, speaking of the same encounter, he, as he talked to King Agrippa, he preached to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 13 through 14, he says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way, on my way to Damascus, a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew tongue. 
saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Notice he says, I heard a voice speaking to me. I don't know how many people are sitting on your row, but the Lord can move on the row. But the whole row uh, ought not to hear what the Lord said to you. Hallelujah. Notice in 22 and verse 9 of chapter of Acts, uh, the 22 and 9, they heard not the voice, Paul says, of him that spake to me. Chapter 26 and 14, I heard a voice speaking to me. But Luke also writes about Paul's or Saul's personal encounter. Back in chapter 9 and verse 4, he says, And he, Saul, fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him. Personal. Personal. It's amazing how seldom today we hear preachers preach about when they got saved. I have preachers uh, uh, in my life who are close to me. That it, but if I had to tell you how they got saved, when they met the Lord, how they came to Jesus, if you stuck a gun to my head, I'm talking about pastors, if you stuck a gun to my head, I would just be a dead man because I've never heard them tell that story. How do you know somebody for 20 years? How do you know, how, how can someone know you for 30 years? How can someone uh, uh, be uh, intimate with you and, 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 and you go through the storm and the rain together and they not know your story? Could it be that you don't have one? It is said that people to whom no one knows what their passion is, it is said that it's because they don't have a passion. Because whatever you are passionate about, people will know it because it comes out sooner or later. How can you know Jesus? How can you have had a personal encounter and nobody knows your story and to pastors out there and no one knows your story and you get the mic every Sunday. Sometimes twice on Sunday. Sometimes Sunday morning, Sunday at 8 a.m., 10 o'clock and the evening service and don't nobody know your story. And yet we know Paul's story. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died. Uh, no controversy swirls around the date of Isaiah's encounter. It was 740 B.C. For that was the year that Uzziah died. God's timing it's impeccable. It's impeccable. It is flawless. It is without defect. Uzziah was one of Judah's greatest kings. A great king may have left the throne or was perhaps dying or in decline. But the greatest king was still on the throne and he made sure that everybody knew it. Can I get a witness? Let me just say this, and, and I'm going to wrap this up. You all aren't praying with me. But just as an aside, most prophets record the time when they had their closest encounter with God. Moses in Exodus 3 tells of the burning bush. Jeremiah in chapter 1, tells of how God chose him to be a deliverer from his mother's womb. Ezekiel experienced an incredible vision while in Babylon. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now Isaiah gives his commissioning, his vision. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. The account of Isaiah's experience is not misplaced. Even though it comes in chapter 6, it is not misplaced. The prophet places it here because throughout the book, the question of what 
with Isaiah takes place over the question of who. When Isaiah wrote his book, he was not ego tripping. It didn't have to be about him. He mentions his name only when it was relevant to a historical happening and omits it entirely when the vision takes him into a future of which he will not be part. So one might ask, what gives him the right to pronounce judgment? In chapter 5, woe unto them. He, pr he pronounces judgment on Israel's leaders. He cries out, how did the faithful city become a harlot? He rebukes the women of Israel. Are you praying for me? Yeah. Chapter 1, he want to know how did the faithful city become a harlot? In chapter uh, uh, 3, he rebukes uh, the, the women of Jerusalem and prophesies of a great war. In chapter 4, he says, seven women will take hold of one man and tell the man we'll eat our own bread, buy our own clothes, just uh, take away the reproach and let us marry you. Chapter 5, he asks, well, how did God fail the people? And then how, and he pronounces woes and woes. How could he do this? He tells how, for he had already had an encounter and he had already visited the throne room of God and he'd already declared of himself, woe is me. See, one of the things that gives us the power to preach the way we do is that by the time we preached it to you, we repented a hundred times. Oh, oh, the... Uh, the things you go through after God gives you a word between the time you get the word and the time you deliver the word. Because see, a good preacher, when he gets the word of God, the first thing he sees is himself. That's the first thing to happen. When God gives me a word, I don't be thinking, boy, this is going to get them. I'm like, ouch. Oh, God, help me. Oh, Lord, save me. Oh, Jesus, Lord. So by the time I bring it to you, I've, I've, I've gotten right with God. <laughs> so we can preach it with power and authority. Amen. Because you can't, you can't prepare the word and hold yourself separate from the word. When, when a preacher prepares a sermon and he doesn't see himself in it, he's not ready to preach. That's why we don't preach to y'all. We preach to us. We don't just say you, it's we. Praise the Lord, because all of us need this. Every one of us need to be able to say, I've had an encounter with God. He said in the year that King Uzziah died. Huh, they lost a, a great king. Uzziah was some king. Second Chronicles chapter 26 tells us uh, uh, all, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah. He's called uh, Azariah in 2 Kings chapter 14. Took, took Uzziah, which means Yahweh is my strength, who was 16 years old and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth, his dad did. He restored the navy and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Praise the Lord. Uh, actually, Uzziah built Eloth and uh, he restored the navy. This was a, a power move. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father did. He was righteous, but he did not remove the groves. And then something drastic happened in his life. Something happened that changed him, that altered the course of his life. The Bible says, and verse 5, and he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who, who 
had understanding in the visions of God. Who was this Zechariah? Of course, this is not Zechariah who wrote the book of Zechariah because this is a hundred, almost 200 years before Zechariah was born. Amen. Before he ministered. This Zechariah was the pastor, the spiritual advisor, the leader, the spiritual leader who had influence on Uzziah. It is said that Zechariah died. He lost his pastor. He lost his spiritual leader. Even the king needed a spiritual man of God. But, but see, most of us now don't know how to be spiritual men of God. We, we're too enamored when we're in the presence of powerful people. We're too enamored by their power, by their grandeur, by their station in life to tell them the truth. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, when you're in the presence of power, you still have to remember you're God's man or you're God's woman. And whether that power is the governor, regardless to the political party, regardless, whether it's the president, whether it's a movie star, whether it's a professional athlete, you don't crumble in their presence. If God had blessed you to be in their presence, you're not in their presence to agree with them. You're in their presence because you have something that they don't have. Zechariah did not understand the visions. Uh, uh, Uzziah did not understand the visions of God. Zechariah did. But Zechariah died. And the Bible says this, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Oh, and did not, oh my Lord, uh, uh, Uzziah prosper. The Bible says, and he went forth and warred against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jebne, Ashdod, the cities of Ashdod, and among the Philistines. Look at this, verse 7. God helped him uh, uh, against the Philistines, against the Arabians. Look at this, verse uh, 8 says, and the Amorites gave gifts to Isaiah. He was so powerful until other countries and other people began to pay tribute to him and his name spread abroad even to the entering of Egypt for he strengthened himself exceedingly look at his reign look at his reign moreover Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the gate at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the the turning of the wall and fortified all of the walls of the city he built also towers in the desert and dig many wells. He had much cattle. He was rich both in the low country and in the plains. Uh, husbandmen also. He had farmers and vine, vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, Mount Carmel, he had vine dressers for he, Uzziah, loved husbandry. He was a horticulturalist. Things grew. The economy grew. The military grew. The defense grew. Moreover, Uzziah, Uzziah had a host of fighting men. The army loved him. That went out to war by bands and according to the number of their account and by the hand of uh, Jael, uh, the, the scribe, and Manasseh, the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captives, and the whole number of, of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of Vela were 2,600. And under their hand, was an army, 300,000 and 7,500 and made war with, the, with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared, uh, look at this, and he, Uzziah prepared them throughout all the hosts. All the hosts, look at this, he gave them uh, weapons to fight with. He gave them shields, gave them spears, gave them helmets. See, the army loved him. Slains gave him stones. The army loved him. 
and he made Jerusalem engines and invented, uh, invented by cunning men. He had great inventors and skillful men working for look at Look at the progression of this man. To be on the towers of the bulwarks, these engines, they could throw huge rocks, place them on the towers, and look at this, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. Till he was strong. As African Americans, we've been trained we're the best at managing poverty, but we do, a, we do a lousy job at managing wealth. We know how to live and to serve God with the light bill due, gas bill too, telephone disconnected, and waiting for the next paycheck. Oh, we can do it. We can dance all across the floor. But it seems to me when the Lord begins to bless us, all of a sudden, we have everywhere else. We, we've got to go everywhere but to church. We're, we're involved in this, that, and the other. Everything but God. Our athletes, when they make the pros, many of them never visit their churches again. Many of them, when they get money and power and fame, they sell their souls. They take positions. That they would have, that they would have never taken had they been poor and stayed in the hood. All kinds of things happen. You got to know that prosperity carries a spirit. Elevation carries a spirit. Success carries a spirit. And when the Lord prospers you, that's the time to get on your face. That's the time to get on your knees. That's the time to show up for services when not many people are, are, are here. This is the time to come to Bible study. Come to prayer meeting. Keep yourself grounded because when you begin to prosper, the first thing the devil will tell you is that you don't need God. You don't need prayer. You don't need Bible study. Thank God. For, I don't care if you have all of the alphabets behind your name. You are so degreed. You still need the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't let, don't, let, don't let blessings fool you. I know of a case where a woman was real big. She was real big and she lost weight. She was real big and lost weight. And when she lost weight, she was real big. And she lost weight. And when she lost weight, the world changed because I had to, uh, she, when she was big, uh, uh, she, I'm, uh, she, she wasn't real noticed. And uh, when, she got, when she lost weight, all of a sudden, boys started paying her attention. And she started getting cat calls and uh, uh, eyes. And it was a whole new world for her because she never experienced it. Next thing you know, she left her husband. She could not handle being pretty. Be careful when the Lord blesses you. Oh, everybody's looking at me now at the stoplight. Nobody paid attention to me at the stoplight when I was driving that other car. They're looking at me now. Hey, pay attention to the light. Matter of fact, the light's green. Go on. <laughs> you got to know how. You got to know how to handle being blessed. Lord blesses you and you finally get that, that, that suit or that home or whatever it is you've been after. You land that job. You land that situation. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Boys who have been taught better, who know better, been taught better, praise the Lord, come up better. Parents told them all the time, Do you, you keep your skin clear. God got it right. God got it right when he made you black. God got it right when he made you white. God got it right he, when he gave you your pigmentation. Don't you write on yourself. As soon as, as soon as they think they're going pro. I mean, in the ninth grade. Oh, oh my God. Just, just get a few people praising you, saying you have potential, and the thing goes to your head. Let me tell you something. Don't you be the kind of person who is easily flattered. You're not all of that. Praise the Lord. 
add about 90, take away 90% from that compliment, and that's the 90% rule, and right there, somewhere in there, they're telling you the truth. Don't let nobody blow smoke and build up your head, and don't let, praise the Lord, the blessings of the Lord. Now you got some money, good, but be the same person that you were. Keep that same shout. Keep that same dance. Keep on shaking your head and waving your hands just as you did when you didn't have the money because you're still the same person and you still need God. Wow! As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you need him more now. Because the Bible says, they that be rich pierce themselves through with many hurtful lusts. That's a different world. That's a different world. See, a lot of, a lot of sins, a lot of sins that you hadn't committed, you, 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 you hadn't committed them because you can't afford them. I'm going to let that sit in for a minute. Because some sins take money. And if you don't have any, you can't do it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some folk, you're not a candidate unless they think you have money. And then all of a sudden, you find out, after the Lord bless you, there's a different world. Different rules. Different game. You can get away with now more than you. Yes, and people, people bow down to you now. Walk into the restaurant, but they move you to the front of the line. Walk into a service, and oh, you get ushered to the pulpit. Pull up on the church ground. They got a special parking spot for you. That stuff can go to your head. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you go from being brother and sister saved to brother and sister wonderful. And the next thing you know, the next thing you know, you make the error that this king did. Time for me to land this plane. Bible said he did it till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was filled, was lifted to his own destruction. Let me tell you what he didn't do. This is going to help a little bit. It's going to help in the house. It's going to help in the house. I, 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 I want to help us in the house. When, he was, when his heart was lifted, Uzziah never strayed into idolatry. Uzziah never worshipped a false god. So it shows you, you don't have to leave the church to become an Uzziah. He stayed in the church. Uzziah never served Malcolm, Ashtoreth, Baal, or any of the false gods. Even though he left the grove up, he himself, that was not his sin. His sin was he lost his respect for order. Oh, Lord. Bible said, that he walked in, his heart was lifted to his own destruction. For he transgressed the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now he was a great king, but he was never consecrated to burn incense. That was the function of the priest. Mm, it amazed me how all of the politicians are telling the preacher, you just stick to preaching. But these same politicians are trying to change the laws that affect what we can preach. Good God Almighty. He went into the temple and he began to burn incense on the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him. And, and, and he took 80 priests with him. And they were valiant men. They were uh, porters. They were gatekeepers. They were Levites. They were priests 
there were priests who went in to protect the house of God. And they withstood Uzziah, the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee. That is, it is not suitable unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord. You can't let where you live. You can't let what you drive. You can't let that expensive outfit. You can't let that wonderful bank account. You can't let your notoriety cause you to step out of your lane. They said, King, I'm not getting any help now. It doesn't appertain to you to burn incense to the Lord. He says, but to the priest and the sons of Aaron, for they are consecrated to burn incense. I want to tell the politician, you can't tell us what to preach because we're the ones who are consecrated to declare the word of God. Oh, Lord, you can't tell us what's right and what's wrong. And I want to tell some of you in the pews, you can't tell the preacher what to preach about and what to cry loud against. You can't tell us what standards to set, what standards to make, because you are not consecrated. That does not pertain to you. And until you've been consecrated, you haven't been. So stop acting like you are. Get on back in your place and be blessed of the Lord and highly favored. You can be blessed where you are, but when you try to step out of your lane and begin to do what doesn't appertain to you, that's when you mess up. Uzziah was somebody's king. He was a mighty man of God, but his success went to his head. I wish somebody would just grab their success and just symbolically throw it down and say, Lord, I'm going to stay humble at your feet. Athlete, be careful. I know they're praising you because you can shoot the ball, run the ball, and throw the ball. But let me tell you something. Life is more than a ball game. Oh, Lord. Singers, I know your head is big because everybody loves your voice. But life is more than a song. Uzziah went in the temple. He began to do things that he wasn't consecrated to do. And the priest tried to stop him, but he wouldn't even listen to him. But guess what happened? God got involved. Leprosy jumped off of the altar and got on him. And guess what? When the leprosy got him, he ran out of the temple. When God's judgment got him, his eyes came open then. I wish somebody would get up with the one Wade and tear Brother Wade. I know you got commercials. I know you have. I've had a wonderful career. I see you on television advertising Gatorade. But I, Wade, a grown man, don't support his 11-year-old son when the boy comes out and calls himself a homosexual. Ah, Wade, I know that the world has accepted you. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't be in movies next. But sir, that's your son. Saints, y'all don't hear me. You got to stay humble at the feet of Jesus. He is a good place for somebody to say, Lord, I humble myself. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I humble myself. Yes, sir. Just high five somebody and tell them, don't let it go to your head. Don't let it go to your head. I know you're doing good. I know you look good. I know you're doing good. You preach the good word. You drive a nice car. You get that, that hairdo is awesome. Nice suit. I see the bling bling, but you got to know how to throw that stuff down and say to the Lord, I'm nothing without you. Can't live without you. 
can't walk without you, can't think without you. Got to have Jesus, for I just can't make it by myself. He's my keeper, he's my joy, he's the lifter of my head. Oh, Lord. Somebody praise him in this place. Uzziah, he got leprosy. He got leprosy. And with that leprosy, they brought him down. They brought him down. He had to leave the palace. He lost his joy. He lost his fame. And he died. When he died, they lost a good king. But I thank God. I thank God in my clothes. Isaiah said, he died, Uzziah died, but the same year that Uzziah died, I saw, I saw the Lord, yeah, yeah, he said, the same year that Uzziah died, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and even though the king was dead the Lord was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and his glory was everywhere the glory of the Lord is everywhere it's right where you are it's right at your address it's on the pew you ought to lift your hands and praise God for his glory yeah, yeah, oh, my Lord. Praise him like you're nothing without him. Praise him like you're nothing without him. Praise him. He said, I saw him. Let me tell you, you can talk about me. You can try to shame me on Facebook. You can scandalize my name. You can talk about a family member or two. But let me tell you, I know the Lord. He laid his hands on me. Oh! I've been saved, I've been washed, I've been born again. I saw him. Did you see him? Did he save you? Have he ever touched you? Have you ever seen the glory of the Lord? Do you know him for yourself? Yeah, yeah. Ah! Praise if you know him for yourself. Uh, do you remember where you were when Jesus saved you? Do you remember what year it was when the Lord laid his hand on you? Oh, I remember. And it gives me joy yeah, every time I think about it. Somebody say, yeah, yeah, Lord. Go on and testify. Tell somebody about your year. Woo! I still remember, I still remember November the 20th, 1977, the Lord laid his hands on me. 
Stewart Street, Rockingham, North Carolina, Temple Church of God in Christ, facing the pulpit on the left side of the altar. I found Jesus and he found me. Good God Almighty, and I'm glad. How many are glad that you remember? How many can say, I know him for myself? I'm glad Bishop Blake knows him, but I know him for myself. I'm glad for the general board, but I know him for myself. Oh, I'm glad that my wife knows him. I'm glad that my children know him, but I, I know him for myself. Isaiah said, I saw him and his train, his cape, the robe, fill the temple. Yes, sir. Ah, and it wasn't Solomon's temple. It was the throne room of God. And I saw winged creatures flying around in glory, shouting, Holy! Let me hear you. Well, I know this is a little crazy, but bear with me. I'm almost done. But would you do this for me? Because I still have a little athletic competitiveness in me and from time to time it uh, rears up and leaks into my preaching and get into my ministerial duties but I wonder would you just look at somebody you ain't got to hold their hand you ain't got to touch them but see who can cry holy the loudest oh Lord you will not let that person holla! 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 Yeah! yeah! Hey, hey, I testify, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, he laid his hands on me, let me tell you that, I know the Lord, everybody sing, let me hear you say, I know the Lord, he laid his hands, one more time sing, I know the Lord, everybody sing, Lift your voice and sing, I know the Lord. He laid his hands on me. Listen, he laid, he laid, he laid, he laid, he touched me, hand of love. He touched me, from up above. He laid, hands on me. He laid, hands on me. God did it, God did it. You can't take it. 
take it. Can't take it from me. Lay your hand on me. Sunday morning, November 12th, 1977. Oh Lord, at the temple of Church of God in Christ. He lay hands on me. I know the Lord. Somebody thinking about it. <laughs> In the year that a good king reigned for 52 years, became arrogant, profaned the temple. Gatekeepers, we're not going to profane the temple. See, that's what the other night was all about. We're going to profane the temple. We, we get that important. We're asking for it. And you'll die in shame. In that year. And, and Uzziah died in shame. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. In my clothes today. Nations turn against him. But his will prevails. Kings compete against him. But fall in shame. People turn from him to worship idols. But their false gods crumble. Even his people refuse to trust him. But they did not escape punishment. And mysteries of mysteries. A pagan despot became his instrument of judgment. But even he, Cyrus, must pay for his sins. Yet, through it all, the sovereign Lord promises to have a people, a remnant, a man, a woman, men and women who have had a personal experience with him who will stand with him. For it is the sovereign Lord who writes history. The late great Otis Lockett said, a testimony is an undeniable experience that one have had with God in the past that forever shapes their future. I've had such an experience. 
Isaiah has had such an experience. You won't stay saved in a day like today without having had such an experience. You can't, God bless you, mighty man of God, Murray. You can't, you can't get it from your parents. I, I, can't, I can't give it. I can, I can tell uh, Crystal and Patrick about it, but they can't get it through osmosis. Doesn't, it doesn't come through Ken. Pam and I share the same bed, but we can't, I can't contract it from her, nor her from me. You can be born and come up in the same household, but you can't get it that way. You, you can be a part of a good church. This is a good church. We shout when we get happy. We don't apologize for preaching scripture. We don't apologize for taking a, a biblical stance and we let our position be known no matter who's in the White House. We let it be known under Obama and we let it be known under Trump. And whoever's next, whether it's him or whomever, will still do the same thing. And that's why I have no respect for any of these preachers today who's got a lot to say now. But eight years under Obama when marriage was redefined and all the other stuff, these clowns said nothing. And no man has any credibility as a man of God if you would be dumb enough to admit that you supported a person and gave them a pass solely based on the color of their skin. Because is not that what we charged white people with? We said that they were racist because they gave people favor based on the color of their skin. So you mean to tell me we're going to turn around and do the same thing and still claim to keep credibility and overlook the scripture? No, regardless of who it is. When you've had an experience with God, then you know you have the conviction and you, you have the knowledge, first of all, that he's in charge. Well, yeah. And it will be remiss of me in my clothes. I'm done. I'm going to, I'm going to take my seat. I've done well. In my, in my clothes. Physically, I mean. I don't know if I preach. I, I preach the best I could. But I want to say this because the message would be incomplete without this. When Isaiah entered and saw Longmire, the holiness of God, he did not leave the holiness of God saying, I've been called to be a bishop. I've been called to be an entrepreneur. I've been called to be the president. I've been called to be something of grandeur. Yes, sir. That's, not what you, that's not what you lead the presence of God with. When you left the presence of God, he says, woe is me. Woe is me. Nobody leaves the presence of God saying I'm somebody. And then if, and if there's a danger that you might, the Lord will give you a thorn in the flesh. For Paul saw things that wasn't lawful for a man to see, heard things that wasn't lawful for a man to hear, and says, lest I should be exalted above measure, a thorn was given me. All these people have been in the presence of the Lord and come out thinking like superstars. You ever been in God? He says, for I am undone. Undone literally means I'm in a fallen state. Amen. I'm disqualified. When he saw God, he said, man, I'm nothing. 
Why? He says, first of all, notice the way the, the, the preacher now. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. Now notice how you can go home and just talk about the church, talk about the pastor, talk about everybody that's wrong, but you never talk about yourself. Isaiah started with himself. He said, I'm undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. What does that mean? My mouth is foul. And lips in Hebrew thought, lips uh, was tantamount. The lips literally, literally reflected uh, the heart. Oh my God, and then Jesus told us, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes, so when he says, I am a man of unclean lips, he says, my heart ain't right. Also, I do not qualify because what the Lord needed was a spokesman That's right. That's right. he said I'm not qualified I can't carry this message because my mouth is dirty I can't there's something God won't say but I can't say it there's a story that Lord wants told, but I can't tell it. Right. Look at the young man on the, on the, on the now all, all my sermon was done before all this stuff happened. But look at this guy. He's, he's upset that we didn't let him sing, but he cursed. Are you going to stay for service? H, no. He is perverted. He is undone. He can't, any church that a person like that can lead praise and worship in, it's not a church. Right. The, the church, the, the watchman is blind. And the church mother is blind. And the first lady is blind. And the, and, the, and the singers and the musicians have no discernment. All of them blind. Isaiah was not blind. He said, I am disqualified. I can't say it. So what did the Lord do? Now, God didn't disagree with him. He said, you're right. You are. After he saw what those seraphims were doing and the holiness of God. So you know, you know what God did? He fixed it. A seraphim took a coal off the altar, flew down, and touched Isaiah's lips. And then said, now you're ready. Your sins have been taken away. Your iniquities are gone. Now we need somebody to speak for us. He said, well, well, since I got myself straight, well, since I got my business fixed, I got my house in order, here am I. Send me. Personal experience. 